In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. But before I ask for any questions without notice uh, and then call the Honourable the Prime Minister, I would just like to say that prior to uh, um, member statements, there was a question raised about appropriate use of Twitter in the chamber, uh, which was raised by the Leader of the House. I wish to report to the House that the matter has been resolved to my satisfaction. I call on the Honourable the Prime Minister. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? No. I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but it is, I, I, think it, I, think, I think it would assist the House if I was able to. The uh, I Madam, call Speaker, the Prime uh, Madam Speaker, Madam um, Speaker, I thought it would, I thought it would, I thought it would uh, assist the House if I was able to inform the House and members opposite that uh, this morning I received the letter from President Udiano that he promised last night. I uh, want to assure the House that the government will respond uh, swiftly, fully, and courteously to the President's letter. Uh, as always, uh, my intention is to do everything I reasonably can uh, to strengthen this relationship, which is so important to both our countries. Uh, I want Australia to remain Indonesia's trusted partner now and in the future. Are there any questions without, on indulgence? The uh, uh, Leader of the Opposition. The position, I thank the Prime Minister for his uh, information to the House. And the position of the opposition on this matter is clear. Let me again in this place reiterate our commitment to bipartisan support in the swift and timely restoration of Australia's relationship with Indonesia. We know that our relationship with Indonesia can recover, it can thrive, it can prosper, it must. Uh, our commitment is to see the improvement and repair of this relationship conducted in a timely way. Our position continues to be one of support for the government. Now is the time for temperate language and carefully calibrated discussion with our Indonesian colleagues. As I've said in this place on a number of times in recent days, a strong and constructive relationship is fundamental to our national interest. The seriousness of this matter or the sense of offence that our Indonesian friends are feeling mean that we must redouble our efforts to return to a positive and constructive dialogue between our governments other nations have resolved similar matters. We can too, and we must do this in a timely manner. Yeah. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Minister for Industry. I refer the Minister to the CSIRO, an organisation which is central to Australia's future, future prosperity through scientific achievement and innovation. Minister. Why are 600 staff to face the Abbott Acts? I call the Honourable the Minister for Industry. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And as the Leader of the Opposition knows, management decisions on the CSIRO are decisions by the CSIRO. I call the Honourable Member for Reid. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister inform the House how lower electricity bills because of the repeal of the carbon tax will help Australian families get ahead? What stands in the way of lower cost of living pressures for families in my electorate? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do thank the member for Reid for his question. Uh, I welcome him to the House and I congratulate him on the really warm and genial and generous maiden speech uh, that he made earlier in the week. Now, Madam Speaker, uh, the uh, member for Reid has just voted to repeal the carbon tax. In fact, every member of the coalition has just voted to repeal the carbon tax. Uh, the coalition went to the election promising to repeal the carbon tax, and I am proud to be able to say in this House that we are keeping faith with the mandate that we sought from the people. By contrast, Madam Speaker, every single member of the Labor Party has just voted to keep the carbon tax. That's what every single member opposite has just 
done. They said before the 2010 election that there would never be a carbon tax. They said before the election a couple of months ago that the carbon tax had been terminated, and yet this tax, which they say has been terminated, they have just voted to keep. That's what members opposite have done. A point of order from the member for Kennedy. Justly endorsed what the Prime Minister is saying, but I'd like him to include me as a person that voted against it, please. Uh, there is no point of order, and the member for Kennedy wouldn't want to try that one again. I call the uh, Honourable the Prime but, Minister. But, but, Madam Speaker, you can understand the member for Kennedy's enthusiasm to repeal the carbon tax, an enthusiasm which ought to be shared by members opposite, because in voting to keep the carbon tax, this is what they have voted to do. They have voted to keep every household's costs $550 a year higher than they should be. They have voted to keep domestically produced cars $400 more expensive than they should be. They have voted to keep gas bills $70 a year higher than they should be. They have voted to cut our aluminium production by 60 per cent by 2050, to cut our iron and steel production by 20 per cent by 2050. They have voted to cut our gross domestic product by $1 trillion by 2050. They have voted to reduce our gross national income by $5,000 a person by 2050. They have voted to cut wages on my by left. 6 per cent by 2050. That is what they have voted for. Let us be absolutely crystal clear, Madam Speaker. Every family's electricity bill is $200 a year higher thanks to that bill over there. That is what they voted for. Electricity bill. I call the honourable member for Isaacs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Justice. I refer to the disaster recovery payment provided by the former government to victims of natural disasters, including victims of the Black Saturday fires and the Queensland floods. Why has the government cut emergency payments for bushfire victims? Isn't forcing them to face the Abbott Axe the cruelest cut of all? I call the honourable the member minister. I call the Leader of the House. That uh, question at the end contained argument and I'd ask an epithet, obviously an epithet. I'd ask you uh, to rule that bit of it out of order. The manager of opposition business. We simply ask that the ruling be consistent with a similar issue that was raised yesterday. Um, I must be honest and say I didn't hear the tail end of the question, but I'll let it stand and I'll call the, mini the I'll call I'll call the Minister for Justice. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do appreciate this question because it allows me to update the Parliament and place on the record uh, what has actually happened in relation to the New South Wales bushfires uh, and certainly correct some of the misleading statements that have been made by the opposition on this. Can I firstly say that in relation to the New South Wales bushfires, in line with uh, very long-standing arrangements with New South Wales, the Commonwealth has jointly funded uh, relief for people who are in need of it um, as a result of this serious natural disaster. Uh, that means, through these long-standing arrangements, uh, we make sure that people in need of short-term accommodation, people in need of emergency food, people in need of clothing, uh, and people uh, even in need of things such as cash grants, uh, can have them available through the services that the New South Wales government runs in the wake of the bushfires and which we fund. Uh, on top of this, um, we have also uh, announced that we will fund the disaster recovery payment, um, which is for families who have been severely impacted by these bushfires, um, which means that they have had lost or damaged homes, where they have had somebody who was severely injured or who have lost a loved one. That is in line with very long-standing practice of the previous Howard government, and most importantly, it is in line with long-standing practice of the previous Labor government, when they were in government. Uh, so the the Labor Party is running around saying that we have changed the guidelines, even though on many occasions when they were in government they activated the disaster recovery payment in exactly the same way that I have done so in relation to the bushfires. And let me just run through the circumstances in which this happened. January 2008, 
Storms and flooding in Mackay on the Whitsunday Islands. The Labor Party activated the disaster recovery payment in exactly the same way as I have just done in relation to the New South Wales bushfires. In February 2008, flooding noise. in Mackay, Member for the Labor government activated the disaster recovery payment in exactly the same way as I have just done. Look at them conferring. Check the facts, and I'll keep running through it. And you might want to ask the shadow minister there, uh, Jenny Macklin, because she was the minister that activated it in exactly the same way as I just have. Uh, in November 2008, it was activated in exactly the same way for storms in Queensland. In the minister will resume his seat. I call the member for Isaacs. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Point of order, direct relevance. The question was why this government has cut, cut criteria from the disaster recovery payment. I haven't finished. And the uh, minister your has. Your point of order is concluded. The minister, member will resume his seat. The question was about emergency funding to victims. The answer is in order. There is no point of order. I call the minister. There is no change. Okay, the deputy leader. Of I call the uh, member for Isaacs, but would remind him his head. He's I, direct relevance. I was relevance. interrupted, Madam Speaker, by the no, leader of the house no, I'm sorry. before I had finished I'm sorry. the point of order, uh, you had finished. and you permitted it. The member will resume his seat. The member had made his point of order. And I said there was no point of order. I have said that this question is relating to uh, the payment of emergency payments, and I call the minister. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, just to reaffirm, Madam Speaker, Speaker my uh, deep apologies. Just to reaffirm to the Parliament, there has been no change in the guidelines for the funding of the Australian Disaster Recovery Payment, and we have declared for the New South Wales bushfire in exactly the same way as the, minister, the shadow minister who just interjected did on five separate occasions. March 2010 in relation to storms in Victoria, May 2009 in relation to flooding in Queensland. Uh, Madam Speaker, we will continue. We, Madam Speaker, and as I said, there's been no change and we've done it in I call the member for right. Give him Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline the impact of Labor's constant opposition to repealing of the carbon tax, repealing of the mining tax, and cleaning up Labor's debt on the Australian economy, particularly for the good people of my electorate and right? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And they are good people and right, and they've got a good representative as well. And on the 7th of September, the Australian people voted emphatically in favour of our policies uh, to repeal the carbon tax, to repeal the mining tax and to fix up what they knew to be Labor's budget black hole. That's what they voted for. Now, I'm afraid the opposition hasn't come to terms with that. I understand that, but the fact is that they are voting against everything we are trying to do to fix up the mess that they have left for the Australian people. They have terminated the carbon tax termination. Uh, it was their turn to say the carbon tax was terminated. Now they've terminated the termination. And now they're in favour of the carbon tax, which is a hit on Australian business, which is a hit on Australian families, which is a detractor from economic growth. And the Labor Party wants people to lose jobs, which is part and parcel of the carbon tax. So the Labor Party now is going down the path of punishing the Australian people for opposing the carbon tax. And the mining tax, a net cost to the budget of $13.5 billion, a flawed tax that has cost jobs, that has created sovereign risk, that has had a negative impact on Australian government debt. The Labor Party now says they want to keep the mining tax and all of its associated expenditure. Again, the Labor Party is failing to recognise the decision of the Australian people. And when it comes to dealing with a budget deficit, uh, I wish the first question in question time had been addressed to me from the Leader of the Opposition. Don't leave me out of it, Bill. Ask me a few questions about the cuts, because they're the Labor Party's cuts. What chutzpah to come in here and complain about cuts that the Labor Party started just a few weeks ago when they were in government. 
What chutzpah that they should do that? Complete hypocrisy from the Labor Party, but no surprise. Their hypocrisy knows no bounds. And why? Because the 7th of September never happened in their own minds. There was never a change of government. They, they, they rotate through the leaders, but it's still the good old Labor Party on the Treasury benches. It's just temporary that they're sitting over there. Well, here's a, here's a news flash. Here's a news flash. And the flash is this. The Australian people made an emphatic decision on the 7th of September to get rid of a bad government. They voted to get rid of the carbon tax. They voted to get rid of the mining tax, and they voted for responsible budgeting. And I say to the Labor Party, enough is enough. You did so much damage in government. Don't continue the trend in opposition. I call the honourable member for Grangeler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. I refer to the statement by his assistant minister that the government is committed to the funding we announced for the Great Northern and North West Coastal Highways. I also refer to the Deputy Prime Minister to his spokesman's comments that these projects will not be funded. Aye. Deputy Prime Minister, will these projects face the Abbott Axe? I call the uh, Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Madam Speaker, uh, the Labor Party announced a large number of road funding projects to be funded by the proceeds of the mining tax. These two roads were amongst those projects that Labor said it was going to fund from the proceeds of the mining tax. There are few, if any, proceeds from the mining tax. So Labor was making empty promises. They are promising to fund roads for which they never had the financial resources. That was a dishonest election promise. Now the coalition is reviewing the election promises of the Labor Party, the ones that they hadn't funded. We know that there are some very worthwhile projects that were on that list, and we would like to find a way for them to proceed. And so as we as, as we look at the resources that are available for road funding, those projects will be under consideration. We will not reject them just because Labor dishonestly promised them when they didn't have the financial resources. Uh, we will deal and fund worthwhile road projects across the nation in a bigger road program than Labor has ever dreamed of. I call the honourable member for Page. Thank you. The member will resume his seat. The member for Grandler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I seek leave to table the transcript of interview 6PR Perth with Paul Murray, in which Jamie Briggs says that the funding is, is in the budget. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. I call the honourable member for Page. The member Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question no, is— The member for Page will resume his seat for a moment. The member for Grandler. I also seek leave to table the west.com.au from the Deputy Prime granted? Minister where he says it Le won't be funded. No, leave is not granted. So then I call, I call the honourable member for Page. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture. I remind the Minister that today is World Fisheries Day to recognise and celebrate the sustainability of Australian fisheries. What impact has the carbon tax had on this iconic Australian industry? And how will the government's plans restore the future prospects of Australian fisheries? I call the Honourable the Minister for Agriculture. Well, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Member for his question. And with a seat that includes Ballina and Yamba, uh, he has got a very keen understanding about the importance of the fishing industry. And it's also important because of one of the uh, inflections to that industry has come about by the Labor Party in their desire, in their desire that they would single-handedly single call the planet with a tax. Now we all know, we all know that if our Labor taxes called the planet, the place would be an icebox. But um, it's quite clear that the Labor Party have decided that they would uh, inflict this on fishermen. Madam it's Speaker, do you know, do you know that when, when fishermen come to port? to buy refrigerant gases, refrigerant gases such as 507A refrigerant gases, 
that these, the cost of this gas has gone up by up to $100 a kilogram. Me, and what this means, Madam Speaker, is that this is a $10,000 $10, hit to the budget for coming home to port. And the member for Ho the, the, Kevin Hogan understands this, the, the member for Page understands this all too well. And not only that, Madam Speaker, you understand that once they get home, once they get home, once they get the produce, Australian fish to be fed to Australian people, and they're using Australian power to try and make sure that they keep the fish cold. Well, that is also taxed by the Australian Labor Party. They believe they believe that the coal that keeps Australian families warm and Australian fish cold is there's something evil about it. But they've got a way. They've got a way to make the power that keeps fish cold righteous. What you do, you see, what you do is you get the coal, and if it passes over water and goes to another country to look after too the much power noise requirements on my another country, the member for Thrust, then it becomes righteous. Says. But if you look after the power requirements in our nation, well, it's very evil. And they had the opportunity today. The government changed deniers on the other side. They had the opportunity today to work for the working man and woman to reduce the cost of living, but they chose not to. They chose not to, because they're still being run by the Australian Greens. They're still being run by the Australian Greens. And we know that it's a coalition. It's a Labor Green coalition. It's a Labor Green coalition. And it's well it's a, and I, the we member, know we've got their attention. The minister we've got their attention. The minister, the minister will resume his seat. The members on my left will lower the tone of interjection and hear what the minister has to say. I, the minister shall resume the call. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I like the fact that in this chamber I seem to excite the Labor and the Greens like I did in the other chamber. But it's great to see that um, we've got one side standing up for the working families and the other standing up for the Australian Greens, the standing up for their Green mates Club. in the corner there, making sure the that we keep Green people poorer. That's your goal. Keep people poorer. And I look forward, I look forward to them explaining to their electorate why it is evil to turn on a light in Bankstown, why it's evil to keep the fish cold, why it's evil to look after the Australian working families' requirements. I call the honourable member for Franklin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. I refer to the more than $109,000 in funding granted by the former government to the Clarence City Council for the redevelopment of the Gilston Bay School Oval as a multi purpose sports ground. Why is the government ignoring the needs of the people of Clarence in my electorate and forcing them to face the Abbott Acts? I call the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I've answered um, this question last week and I'm happy to answer it again. During the election campaign, the coalition <laughs> made a number of very important promises to help regional communities and, and urban communities deliver services and facilities uh, to, to benefit uh, their people. The Labor Party also made a list of promises in which they said that they would implement if they were elected to government. But what the government the doesn't seem to have realised is, as government change deniers, that the election was won by the coalition. We will honour our election promises, which will deliver substantial benefits to the local communities. We feel like the minister will resume his seat. I accept, uh, acknowledge the uh, manager of opposition business. Madam Speaker, the question specifically referred to a grant that had been made, not to an election promise. I call the minister. Call the, de the deputy prime minister has completed his answer. I, I call the member for Kennedy. <clears throat> question, the prime minister. Media reports that Grain Corp by ADM has been prosecuted in America, Canada, Mexico for bribery, price fixing, thousand million fine, three executives jailed. In light of this, and recalling that dairy deregulation cut prices. 19 cents to farmers but increased them 41 to consumers. Would the Prime Minister not agree that Grain Corp's sale creates a corporate monopoly 
in which grain farmers like dairymen will be skinned alive to enable a foreign company to grab an extra one billion a year. I call the, Prime, the honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I do thank the member for County for his question, and I appreciate his concerns, concerns which are quite uh, general in this House, to ensure that the foreign investment Australia gets is the right foreign investment that supports our national interest, not the wrong foreign investment uh, that doesn't. Uh, Madam Speaker, this government, this parliament, this nation uh, has uh, long supported foreign investment. Foreign investment has been a very important part of building the strong economy that we enjoy uh, in this country. Our agricultural industry, our mining industry, our manufacturing industry would not be what it is uh, but for foreign investment. So we do very much support foreign investment, but it does have to be the right foreign investment, foreign investment that clearly is in our national interest. Uh, not the wrong foreign investment. And we have a strong and a good process to determine which is which. Uh, we have the Foreign Investment Review Board, which makes recommendations, and we have the Treasurer, who makes decisions on this matter. Uh, I am confident uh, that this process is being uh, amply uh, pursued in the case in question, and I am confident that it will give our country the best possible result. I call the honourable member for Karankamai. My question is to the Minister for the Environment. I remind the Minister that Colac Area Health's power bill has gone up by around $60,000, or 13 per cent, because of the carbon tax. How will the government's plan to abolish the carbon tax reduce electricity bills for organisations like assist. Colac Area Health. I call the Honourable the Minister for Environment. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and also to the member for Karangamite. Madam Speaker, we are concerned about electricity bills of all types. We are concerned about big electricity bills. We're concerned about nasty electricity bills. And above all else, we are concerned about puffed up, overinflated electricity bills that have risen beyond their natural level. Oh no. And electricity bills can strike anyone the at any time, on my left Madam Speaker. Assist. They can strike any Tom, Dick, Harry, Kevin, or Julia. You can be alone in your office and a nasty electricity bill walks through the door and ruins the member, your whole day. The members on my so left. We are taking steps. We are taking steps to, de uh, to deflate electricity bills. The member for Karangamite raises as a dutiful member the position of Colac Area Health. Well, the Victorian government has billed the cat on the impact of the carbon tax on electricity bills. $60,000. $60,000 on Colac Area Health. Peter McCallum Cancer Institute, $360,000 carbon tax impact on electricity bills. The Royal Children's Hospital, according to the Victorian government, has a $729,000 carbon tax impact on their electricity bill. The entire Victorian health system has a 13 and a half million dollar impact on their electricity bill as a result of the carbon tax and a 132 million dollar impact between now and 2020 let me just repeat the that the member a 132 for as will million the member for dollar impact on victorian health costs as a result of the carbon tax between now and 2020 so we are taking steps prime minister only 2 hours ago this House, this side of the House, voted to repeal the carbon tax yeah. and to take away the $60,000 impact which the member for Karangamite raises with regards to Colac Area Health. Only two hours ago, that side of the House, the ALP, which promised to terminate the carbon tax, voted to keep it. They voted for a $60,000 tax on Colac Area Health. They voted for a 
and $60,000 tax on the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute and a $729,000 tax on the Royal Children's Hospital. We will pass this legislation and we will not stop until it is repealed. They are the only the people Honourable standing Minister between Charles Australians elapsed. and law. I call the member for Ballarat. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister confirm that his government will fund the $100 million upgrade to the Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, a hospital which treats more than 250,000 patients every year, or will this too face the Abbott Acts? I call the Honourable Minister for Health, and I would add that the House was quiet to listen to the question. I ask the House to be quiet and listen to the answer. Well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and it's a reasonable uh, question to, to ask. The proposal was a $156 million proposal from the Victorian state government, and originally the state government said that they would pay for this project in its entirety. Uh, I'm advised that the Gillard government then came in, uh, even though the Victorian government said that they would pay for this project, uh, and in a, another spree of throwing money around, the then Gillard government said that they would fund the $100 million, even though the Victorian government had already said that they would spend the $156 million. So yes, I want to see this facility built, but I want value for taxpayers' money. So we're continuing discussions with the Victorian government about how best we might add value to the Victorian health services. But it struck me a little strange that when you looked at the work of the previous government, they were promising money to build facilities already committed by the Victorian government. And at the same time, they were taking money away from cancer patients. They were promising money to super clinics that never opened and never saw patients. They were spending money on great big new bureaucracies that didn't see a single patient. And all the while, while all of this waste was going on, more and more pensioners were waiting longer and longer for elective surgery. The, the former government absolutely stands condemned in terms of their management of health, and they've continued it, I might say, into opposition. I call, the on I call the honourable member for Ballarat. Uh, I seek leave to table the article from the Herald Sun where the minister has said is he will not granted? be funding the Eye and Ear Hospital. Granted. Thank you. Really? I call the on honourable member for Line. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Education. As a minister representing one of Australia's rural electorates, Will the minister explain how the government's recently announced Productivity Commission inquiry into childcare will improve availability and affordability of services in my electorate of Lyon and others across regional Australia? I call the Honourable the Assistant Minister for Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you and welcome to the member for Lyon. Uh, a great loss to specialist services in regional Australia, but a fabulous addition to this place. And um, I think, Prime Minister, I re recollect a certain polypedal where you, I and the member for Lyons struggled in the freezing rain across the Barrington Tops. And the dedication shown on that occasion is the dedication that the member for Lyon brings on behalf of his constituents to this place, wasting no time. He was in my office this morning banging the table about an early intervention centre for the people of Taree, something that he cares passionately about, Taree being an area of disadvantage in his electorate. And one of the great things about new parliaments, Madam Speaker, is that we get to welcome on this side of the House members from rural and regional Australia. And I get once again to look at members of the Labor Party who have never risked a dollar of their own money in rural and regional Australia. And the problem that we saw the problem that we saw written large over childcare policy in the Labor Party was that one size always had to fit everything. There were no regional members to say, things are a little bit different in my small country town, in my mobile childcare centre, in my small occasional childcare centre, in my community preschool, preschool with a hard-working volunteer board. Things are a little bit different. Oh no, the dead hand of regulation landed on everyone indiscriminately. And nowhere did we, do we see that more in rural and regional Australia. Because as we know, people in rural and regional Australia generally have less money than people in the city, Madam Speaker. 
and they have to be careful about their expenses, but they desperately need childcare. They need childcare and they need it at a price they can afford in an available way and in a flexible way, particularly in a flexible way. But look, everybody is coming on board with our Productivity Commission inquiry. People are lining up to talk about it. Um, the uh, Kalgoorlie miner, another great new regional member, the member for O'Connor, is here. The Kalgoorlie miner talked about the importance of childcare for regional communities, and the mayor said it cannot be understated. And I'd like to quote him. He said, "Paying too much for childcare." Uh, the minister will res resume her seat. I call the deputy leader. I, I, I hesitate to do this, Madam Speaker, um, I, but this is simply uh, not order? relevant to the question that the minister what is, what was is asked. The point of order? It's a point on relevance. She should be directly relevant to the question asked. Thank I would you, have thought she'd a... know how to be directly relevant to a question she wrote. <laughs> I call the honourable the assistant minister. There's no point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to quote the mayor of Kalgoorlie, a city that I went to during the election campaign. And he, he, he makes the point. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the question was about rural and regional Australia, and by the way, Kalgoorlie is in rural and regional Australia. Yeah, yeah. And the mayor of Kalgoorlie says that if you inhibit the ability of too parents much noise to, on my left. if you inhibit the ability of parents to obtain oh. childcare, you inhibit the ability of the city to grow. And on this side of the house, we desperately want rural and regional Australia to grow. Yeah. So I look forward to you coming on, on board with our productivity commission inquiry. Yeah, yeah. I call the honourable member for Rankin. Thank you. Thanks, Speaker. My question is also to the Assistant Minister for Education. 9,600 families in my electorate of Rankin rely on the childcare rebate. Why is the government ignoring their needs by refusing to guarantee the rebate and exposing local families to the Abbott Acts? I call the honourable the Assistant Minister for Education. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And this is a fascinating question, and it tells us so much about the modern Labor Party. Yes, it is true. It is true that uh, this week the Minister for Social Services introduced legislation to maintain the childcare rebate limit at seven thousand five hundred for three financial years starting from the 1st of July 2014. But it's really important to put this into context, Madam Speaker. The context, as usual, is Labor's debt, the debt that we on this side of the House have inherited. And I, we, we've heard a lot of numbers. The Treasurer talks about numbers, eloquently expresses them. But I would just like to put this piece of information on the table. If we run budget surpluses, Madam Speaker, bigger than the budget surpluses ever run by the Howard government, it would take 20 years to pay off Labor's debt. The interest bill alone is over $10 billion a year. I could build the member for Lyons Early Intervention Centre with just a proportion of that money. Labor has never delivered a budget surplus. Never delivered a budget surplus. Now let's just go back to this budget. The, I want to talk about the budget that the, the member refers to. In May this year, you remember the budget that Labor put down, the one they never expected to implement, the one where they scrambled desperately to plug the leaks coming from their own reckless spending, the one where they tried to create a fig leaf of economic credibility. But what they did in this budget, Madam Speaker, was they took the $100 million already in savings that we have had to implement this week. They took that from that particular budget, despite not having passed the legislation. So the $100 million that the member asked me about is long gone, and this government has to legislate to mop up Labor's mess, a mess created by a Labor— I call the manager of opposition business and ask the minister to resume her seat. You cannot go on relevant to the manager of opposition yes, business. Know. What is the standing order? Good no, no, no I'll let it go. Right. I call the assistant minister. I don't know why, don't know why the, the, the Labor Party doesn't understand that the hundred million dollars is long gone from the bottom line. So Remember for it's pretty outrageous to, it's pretty it's pretty outrageous, Madam Speaker, to expect us with the economic credibility and the responsibility we bring to managing the nation's finances, not to implement this measure, which Labor has already taken into account. 
a Labor Party without courage, without imagination, without competence. We make no apologies for cleaning up their mess. I call the honourable member for Hinkler, but before I do, I would remind uh, I would remind those on my left that we will have no more standing orders for um. I call the honourable member for Hinkler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer advise the House of any correspondence he has received that will assist the Parliament in its deliberations on the increase in the debt limit? I call the honourable the Treasurer. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for Hinkler. I was, was kind of hoping that I would be asked this question by the Labor Party, and in particular the member for McMahon, because just before question time, a letter from the member for McMahon was sent to my office just before question time. And I, I read the letter. It's a very interesting letter. I read the letter. And it says, the opposition also remains ready to vote for an increase in the debt limit to $500 billion if such an increase is supported by revised net debt figures in the mid-year economic fiscal offer. I went, hang on, hang on, net debt figures. He couldn't have got net debt and gross debt wrong, could he? And I thought, oh, hang on, hang on, this is a shadow treasurer. I know Labor doesn't understand the difference between deficit and surplus. I know they don't know the difference between Rudd and Gillard, but I would think they would understand the difference between net and gross. And I read on. It said, I note that in Senate estimates, Senator Wong asked Dr Parkinson to provide an updated iteration of Table 8 of PFO showing projected net debt. I thought, well, I'd go to Table 8 of PFO and see what that is. And hang on, it's gross debt. <laughs> it's gross debt. How did that happen? And then I thought, hang on, gross debt peaking at $370 billion. I said, but I still gave him the benefit of the doubt, because surely the shadow treasurer would know the difference between net debt and gross debt, given that this is such a significant issue for the Australian parliament. And I read on, and it gets better. Uh, the latest figure in the forward estimates for net debt is $370 billion. I hope, not. I hope it isn't. I hope it isn't, because the latest estimate of net debt is $217 billion. No wonder they're concerned. No wonder they're concerned. You know what, Madam Speaker? I'm going to help the member for McMahon, because the last sentence, the last sentence of his letter says, given the importance of this as a national issue and debate, and in the interests of open, openness and transparency, I will be publicly releasing this letter. I'm sure he won't. I'm sure he won't. So I'm going to help him now. If the Treasurer of Australia, the former Treasurer of Australia, does not understand the difference between net debt and gross debt, no wonder the Labor Party just doesn't get it. Just doesn't get it. They are incompetent in government and they're incompetent in opposition. Before I call the member for McMahon. I would like to welcome to acknowledge in the gallery the students from the Centre for Defence and Strategic Studies and the Northern Territory Minister for Primary Industry and Fisheries and Minister for Mines and Energy and Minister for Land Resource Management. Welcome. I call the honourable the member for McMahon. Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware that the Treasurer tabled the letter. I seek leave to table the letter given that he didn't. The Treasurer has tabled the letter. Does the member have a well, could he, Madam Speaker, could he, could he the table the updated? Could he table? The member will resume his seat. There will be some quiet on my right. I call the honourable member for McEwen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. I refer to the more than nine hundred and six thousand uh, dollars in funding granted by the former government to the city of Whittlesey for Church Street redevelopment, Woodland Water uh, Recreation Reserve development and the Laylor uh, Tennis Club redevelopment. Why is the government ignoring the needs of the people of McEwen with its cuts and forcing them to face the Abbott Axe? I call the honourable the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Well, the Abbott government is not ignoring the people of McEwen. It's giving them a carbon tax-free future. Yeah, yeah. It's, giving them, yeah, yeah. it's giving their industry a chance to be competitive, 
with industry and the rest of the world. We are providing services and facilities through our roads and infrastructure program that Labor had never committed to. That Labor had never committed to. The people of Australia have looked at the program that Labor offered to them during the election campaign. They have looked at the program that the, that the coalition has offered to them during the election campaign, and they chose the program to, uh, put forward by the coalition. The people have had their say. The people have had their say, and we are now getting on with the process of delivering the promises that we made to the Australian people, and that will be our task over the next three years. I call the honourable member for Higgins. Here, here, here. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. I refer the Minister to testimony of departmental officials in Senate estimates yesterday that the only review undertaken of previous government's laptops in schools program made no attempt to determine if the extra spending had actually improved student results. Minister, what is your response to this revelation? I call the Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the uh, Honourable Member for Higgins for her question. And I can tell her that my response was one of disbelief, Madam Speaker. I couldn't believe that the government had uh, conducted a review into the so-called digital revolution. You'd remember, Madam Speaker, that the previous government had to have these grandiose names for all their programs, a la North Korea of uh, the last few decades. And this one was called the Digital Revolution. It was to be a billion-dollar program to deliver one million laptops in schools. The laptops of the 21st century, Madam Speaker, it was called as well. Of course, after the program, after five years, the program had blown out to $2.4 billion and they delivered 600,000 laptops in schools. The they conveniently claimed another 300,000 like that had already been in schools before the program even began. And they conducted one review. This ranks with the BR, the Pink Bats program, the Cash for Clunkers, more Labor messes. They conducted a review, Madam Speaker, and yesterday, in estimates, the department answered the question about the evaluation with the evaluation was taken under a set of KPIs which were agreed with stakeholders. It was measured against things like the number of a resource made available, the amount of usage in the classroom and those sorts of things, but no direct line of sight measure against student outcomes. So the Labor Party spent $2.4 billion of taxpayers' money delivering two-thirds of the laptops they claimed would be delivered and at no point thought it might be a good idea to find out if it made one jot of difference to the outcomes for students, to the results for students. The member for Perth, no wonder she's shaking her head. The she member can't for believe Wakefield it either. Will she desist. can't believe it either. She actually cares about students in schools, unlike the rest of the Labor Party. The member what for this proves, Madam is Speaker, warned. What this proves, Madam Speaker, is that the Labor Party as we always suspected, are all foam and no beer, Madam Speaker. They are all politics and no policy, all spin and no substance. Whereas the coalition the wants to put King's students first, we actually think the results for students are quite important. We think they're quite important. We don't think you should just spend $2.4 billion to, review, to have our laptops in schools program, review it and not bother to find out if it worked or not. We're putting students first, whereas all the Labor Party ever does is put politics first. I call the honourable member for Kingsford Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. I refer to the grant of $85,000 made by the former government to the Ted Noss Foundation for the upgrade of their community facilities. Why is the government ignoring the needs of disadvantaged young people in my electorate with its cuts? and forcing them to face the Abbott Acts. I call the Hon. Minister for Social Services. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. When this government uh, came to office, it was faced with a stark reality of the situation left by the Labor government, the previous Labor government. And let me put this, let me put this Madam Speaker, in stark contrast. In 2007, when the Labor Party came to government, the nation 
had a net balance of $45 billion. In other words, in other words, the nation was in the black. But what happened over six years? What happened over six years of Labor government? Well, that $2,100 in the bank that every man, woman, and child in Australia had in 2007. What had happened to that by 2013? The reality is, in terms of net debt, as the Treasurer pointed out just earlier, we have something like what is it, $217 billion of net debt. So instead of every man, woman, and child in Australia, instead of every man, woman, and child in Australia having the equivalent of $2,100 in the bank, what were they left with after Labor in government? They were left with $12,900. Uh, in the red for every man, woman and child in Australia. Point of order, Member for Kingsford Smith. I believe that it's all right to avoid answering this question, but the Ted Noss Foundation, uh, on ask, whose behalf if, I ask sorry, this question, do not. If you're My asking, point of order is Understanding Order 104. I ask that the minister be directly relevant. Yes or no? Will the Ted Noss uh, Foundation you, receive the, the $85,000? I call the Honourable the Minister and I would ask him to address the question. I, as indeed, as Madam Speaker. And, and in answer to the question, against the, con con against the background of a Labor Party which was so irresponsible with the finances of this country, so irresponsible with the finances of this country that has left us so far in the red, then where, where expenditure had not been made, where contracts had not been fulfilled, where simply election promises had been made, such as what the honourable member is talking about, the member, well then the we will review will all those promises. Seat. The minister will resume his seat. I call the, uh, the, call the member for Kingsford Smith, but you may not have a second point of order on relevance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe the minister is now defying your order to be directly relevant, and I ask you to again draw there is him no point of to order. the question. I call the honourable the minister. So, and Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker the against, the, against the background of a Labor Party that trashed the finances of Australia, that ran up a huge debt for the people of Australia, where matters had not been contracted, where funds had just been promised in the context of the election campaign, we will do the prudent thing, and the prudent thing is to review all of those matters. Yes. Before I recognise the member for McMahon, has the minister finished his question? He has. Therefore, there is no point for the point of order. The minister has completed his question. And it is? Do I have the call? I have the call. Thank you. Madam Speaker, to assist the minister, I would like to table the International Monetary Fund report endorsing is, the previous government's levels of debt. Of order. Record the level of debt. The member will resume his seat. The member for McMahon will not abuse the standing orders in that way again. I call the uh, member for Granger on a point of order. Uh, I seek leave to table my that press release. That is not a point of order. There, you're, allowed of time, to, no. you're allowed to seek leave to table documents, Madam Speaker, with respect. I am allowed to seek leave is to leave table granted? a document. It is not you haven't even heard what it is. It doesn't matter. Yes, it is. The uh, Leader of the House will resume his seat. The Member for Granger will state very briefly what it is he wishes to yes. table. My media release of Wednesday 28 May 2008 that says that, says no, that we will, we will the honour— The Member may resume his honour. seat. The Member will resume his seat. There is no point of order. Leave is not granted. The Leader of the House will resume his seat, and I have twice asked the Member to resume his. And I would remind the member for Wakefield that he is, ha, has been warned. Unless he wants to leave us again, he'll remember that. I call the member for Swan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. I remind the minister the new that new construction first started in Victoria Park in my electorate in October 2011, when residents were informed they could expect services within 12 months. Will the minister provide an update on the progress of the NBN in Victoria Park and why it will be important to deliver the NBN sooner and more affordably for all Australians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I call the honourable minister for communications. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question, and I can well understand the frustration and disappointment of his constituents. There, there was a $31 billion black hole advised to the Labor government at the end of 2010, and regrettably quite a few truths have vanished into it. One of them was the true state of the broadband rollout by the NBN. In fact, as the honourable member said, in October 2011, the, government, the then government announced that construction had commenced in East Victoria Park and Burswood. Two years later, there is no ready-for-service premises in those areas. Shame. Indeed, Madam Speaker, despite barrels of propaganda, reams of uh, leaflets and flyers and lots of claims, on election day, in total, there were 34 premises in Perth connected to the fibre network, brownfield premises. And across Western Australia, there were 75 brownfield premises connected in the whole state. Madam Speaker, NBN, NBN, connections, NBN connections in Western Australia have been as rare as sightings of Brian Burke. Now, now, right now, right now, Madam Speaker, there are in Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia, right now, as of today, there are 1,395 premises connected to the NBN Brownfields fibre network. This is in the built-up established areas, of which more than half were in the Wollonga trial site that had been built in 2011. So over the last two years, practically nothing has happened. That is why the answer, the honourable member asked me, how can we make this more affordable and cost effective? And the answer is to use a mix of technologies. And how many times have honourable members heard me talk about the virtues of different technologies, fibre to the node, VDSL and so forth? And the frustrating thing, Madam Speaker, as we all know, is we make these powerful cases as advocates and, and we never change the minds of those opposite. No. But Madam Speaker, Sometimes you do. Sometimes you do. And I, Madam Speaker, I was so gratified to receive a warm letter from the member for Adelaide on the 27th of September, congratulating me on my appointment as minister and concluding Adelaide needs and deserves access to fibre to the node, FTTN broadband infrastructure, and I have pledged to do all that I can to ensure that I, they get it. I ask that you please use your appointment as the responsible minister to do the same. Madam Speaker, on this point I will accede to the member for Adelaide's wishes. We will deliver a more cost-effective network, and I table the honourable member's letter. I call the, I call the honourable member for Greenway. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. I refer to the grant of $10,000 made by the former government to the Sea Commission Centre Sydney to purchase new computer equipment for the community. Why is the government ignoring the needs of multicultural communities with its cuts and forcing them to face the Abbott Acts? I call the honourable the Minister for Social Services. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Can I um, indicate to the honourable member who asked the question? and indeed all honourable members in the chamber, that where contracts have not been executed uh, in the light of the Bowen black hole that we inherited, then we will, we will do what a prudent and sensible government would do, and that is that we will review all of those matters. But can I repeat to her that because matters have been promised in the context of an election campaign by the Labor Party, that doesn't mean that we uh, have to honour those agreements, but certainly in a situation where we have got a $200 billion net debt, where we have a Labor Party that could not deliver a surplus for the whole of its six years in government, and now we have to do something about it, well then, in all of those circumstances, and ask about as many of these grants as you like, the answer will be exactly the same. We will act prudently, and that means that we will review all of those matters. I call the honourable member for Barker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Is the Minister aware of a media report on November 19 on the News Corp Australia network 
highlighting the use of health budget resources for a smokescreen music festival that never happened and a burnout competition. How is the government proposing to address waste in the health budget? I call the Honourable health Minister for Health. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Now, call me old-fashioned, but I thought the Minister for Health was responsible for helping sick people, for making sure that when patients turn up to emergency departments, we can provide them with the services that they need. Maybe the even providing leader, elective surgery to pensioners that are waiting for a hip replacement or a knee replacement. But no, that wasn't the approach of the, the previous minister. And again, the previous minister is a little touchy because she knows what's coming. <laughs> she knows what's coming again. So not only did the previous government take money away from chemotherapy services, not only, not only did they promise super clinics that never saw patients, not only did they take money away from desperate patients, but now we find out that they're providing money for burnout competitions. <laughs> for burnout competitions here in Canberra, it's a great capital, but should we be spending money on burnout competitions instead of providing services to patients across the whole country? Well, I'll tell you what, Madam Speaker, under this, under this government, we will not tolerate this sort of waste and mismanagement. The former government left us with $370 billion worth of debt. I promise I promise the Australian people that once we have cleaned up Labor's mess, we will make sure that more patients get elective surgery. I will make sure that it is easier for patients to get in to see their doctors. I want to make sure that instead of, instead of spending money on this nonsense that Labor subscribed to to keep their union mates happy, we will spend it on patients instead. They grew the bureaucracy. They had 18 outside agencies in addition to the department itself and they were spending money on Facebook competitions and spending money on this sort of activity, which will not be tolerated under this government. I will make sure that the health of this nation is put ahead of these sort of ridiculous proposals and funding agreements that Labor entered into, and I will deliver, as this government will, for the Australian patients. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to comments by Mr Mark Texter on the ABC before question time today. Why hasn't anyone from the government spoken to Mr Texter about his offensive remarks concerning Indonesia? And will the Prime Minister now review all the contracts between the government and Mr Texter's company? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, Madam that question, uh, I must say, goes very close to not being within the standing orders, but I'll let it stand and call the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, they were tacky comments and they've been withdrawn and apologised for. I call the Honourable Member for Longman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health. And I refer uh, the Member for Longman may resume his seat. The uh, Leader of the Opposition was a bit slow off his feet, but what is the question? Thanks for that compliment, Madam Speaker. I just want to table the Mark Texter interview of ABC at 1 o'clock today. Leave is not granted. I call the Honourable Member for Longman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the Caboolture GP Superclinic in my electorate that was promised more than three years ago. Can the minister update the House on the delays and the deceptions of the Vulture GP Superclinic and how that has affected the provision of health services in my electorate? I call the honourable member for, uh, Minister for Health. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Speaker. Well, I must say uh, the GP Superclinic was one of my favourite Labor programs. $650 million of taxpayers' money. Uh, First promised in 2007, here we are in 2013. Uh, there's still some that are still in a planning stage six years later. I mean, can, can, can somebody explain to me how, how Labor presided over such incompetence in government? How, how did we spend money? How did our country get to a point where, in the health portfolio, we're spending money on burnout competitions but not on patients? I mean, if anybody had any doubt about the incompetence of the Labor Party, look no further than the former Minister for Health. Look at what Labor did in the portfolio, and the member for Longman is a great local member. 
I mean, he has championed the cause of patients in his electorate over the course of the last five or six years. He wants to make sure that patients can get in to see a doctor. I mean, it's not a big ask. And do you know, Madam Speaker, that this clinic was first promised by the former government on the 12th of August 2010, indeed during the 2010 election campaign. But here we are, three years later, people turning up to this vacant paddock uh, <laughs> expect some sort of clinical services to be delivered, but of course it's not going to reach the standard. I mean, doctors are not going to be able to practice in a vacant paddock because the planning stages are still underway. This is a government that will get on and provide services to patients. Contrast that to Labor's time in health when they promised so much and they wasted so much, but they delivered so little. And I want to make sure, I want to make sure, Madam Speaker, that this doesn't continue, but I am worried about another site. At the last election, the good people of Redcliffe and right across that seat delivered a great member into Petrie. They were sick of the promises that the former member made in relation to the super clinic, so-called, on the Redcliffe Peninsula, because it's also an interesting study. It started out as a $5 million promise. So this is where the government of the day promised to give $5 million to a medical entrepreneur to set up one of these super clinics to compete with doctors who had already put their own capital at risk to deliver services. It was completely devoid of any logic, this program. But give it, uh, give it some time. Does it get better? No. $5 million promised initially, and then $13.2 million the cost blew out to. So, I mean, let, let's try and average this across the number of patients that have been seen in the service, which would be OK if, let's say, a million patients have been seen since that time. But the problem, of course, is with the GP super clinic, clinic in, in uh, Redcliffe is that after $13.2 million and six years, it hasn't seen a patient. It hasn't seen a patient, not one. And so I've said to my office, how can we calculate $13.2 million over zero patients? Well, of course we can't because this is a testament to the incompetence of the previous Labor government. We will fix up Labor's mess and we will get the health system back on track in this country. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's commitment before the election that, under the coalition, no cuts to health, no cuts to education, no change to pensions. Will the Prime Minister confirm, irrespective of what his Commission of Cuts recommends, that health, education and the pension are safe from the Abbott Acts? Yeah. Yeah. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, I'm very happy to get that question, and I'm very happy to say to the Leader of the Opposition and members opposite that we stand by all our election yeah. commitments. Yeah. And I know that surprises members opposite because they never stand by any of them. I know they never stand by any of them. Uh, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know they have made repeated pre-election claims uh, only to dishonour them post-election, but I want to put their minds at ease. We stand by all our pre-election commitments and we will deliver on all our pre-election commitments. I call the honourable the member for Brisbane. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Defence. I remind the Minister that the electorate of Brisbane holds significant uh, defence industry facilities operated by Boeing, uh, GE and TALIS and employing hundreds of local people. Can the Minister describe how the government is helping to support Australia's defence industry and reverse the effects of the previous government's budget cuts? I call the Honourable the Assistant Minister for Defence. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And let me thank the Honourable Member for Brisbane, a former Parliamentary Secretary for Defence uh, in a former outstanding coalition government, and someone who actually stands up for her defence community. Someone who formally stands up for it. And can I say the member for Wakefield will leave on this 94? Can I say to the member, Labor has hit a trifecta. Labor has hit a trifecta. Last week, last week we heard that the Defence Secretary publicly confirming the truth that we on this side have known for so long that your $25 billion worth of cuts had actually impacted significantly yesterday. Yesterday we learnt the former Labor Minister for Defence, Stephen Smith, 
is reported to saying that defence reforms could not be fulfilled because of the acts you took to defence. And today, and today, a leading defence industry body, the Defence Teaming Centre, has said that the Minister for Defence, Stephen Smith, of the previous government, following the re-election of Kevin Rudd, transitioned from disinterested to disengaged. Well, it sounds a bit like Minister Conroy in the previous government, so disengaged he only connected 75 premises in all of WA. The Defence Teaming Centre further went on to say that following the announcement of the election by Prime Minister Gillard, a decision paralysis fell upon the government and the flow of work almost ceased. The White Paper came out with a promise of a defence capability plan and a defence industry policy statement, but neither of those were delivered. That's the way industry viewed the former Labor government. It's dismal. It's a miss. 6,000 jobs lost. 6,000 jobs lost because of your cuts to defence, a massive capability deficit and acquisition pushed out to the never-never. But we know, we know there is a better way. This government, under the leadership of the Prime Minister, is taking a funding envelope for defence. And that funding envelope says there will be no cuts to the defence budget, as opposed to the $25 billion the former Labor government took out. There will be no cut to the defence budget. We will take defence spending as a portion of GDP back to 2 per cent. Where is it now? 1.56 per cent, the lowest level since 1938, and any savings, any savings will be reinvested. We will ensure that the ADF is equipped wherever possible by Australian-made goods, consisting with getting good value for taxpayers' money. We'll make it clear that Australian businesses will be given every opportunity to compete for work because under this government, Australia is back in business. Under this government, the defence is back to being funded. Under this government, we'll get things done. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Well, after uh, 23 questions, as I am advised, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice. Presentation of documents. Oh, I beg your pardon. The, um, the member for Grainler had advised me that he has a personal explanation he seeks to make. Thank you, Speaker. I rise to make a personal explanation. Does he claim to have been misrepresented? Mis uh, I, I do, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald's website today quotes Mr Maxmore Wilton, the chairman of the Sydney Airports Corporation, accusing me of fabrication over my suggestion in this House last night that when he was Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in 2002, he would have known about conditions including a curfew, a movement cap, guaranteed access for regional airlines and a first right of refusal that were applied to the sale of Sydney Airport. Mr Moore Wilton is quoted in this report as calling me, and I quote, a grub, and as saying, and I quote, certainly it was not an issue I was involved in. Madam Speaker, the facts are these. In a question on notice to a Senate Budget Estimates Committee hearing dated May 26, 27, 2003, Senator John Faulkner asked when cabinets uh, had discussed the sale of the airport and whether Mr Moore Wilton was present. The response from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet said that the full cabinet discussion, uh, full cabinet discussed the sale of the airport on December 12, 2000. March 26, 2001, September 24, 2001 and March 11, 2002. The department reported, and I quote from Hansard, Mr Moore Wilton attended all four meetings of Cabinet. And I, ta I table the question on notice and the answer uh, with, uh, with leave. Is leave granted? It's 2003. It will make it easier for them to find in the Senate. Is, is leave granted? Thank you. <laughs> I, call, I call the Honourable the Deputy Leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I rise uh, to, leave seek to, make, uh, to seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the member claim to have mis been misrepresented? Yes, I do, Madam Would Speaker. Would the member then show where she's been misrepresented? Yes, Madam Speaker. The Minister for Health said that I took money away from cancer patients when I was the Health Minister, but in fact spending on new cancer medicines increased dramatically under my watch. In fact, more than 30 new medicines were listed on the PBS for 17 different types of cancers. And 
In fact, no patient ever paid more than $36.10 for medicine subsidised under the PBS. I call uh, for presentation of documents. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. Full details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings and Hansard. Thank you.